so yeah, what could go wrong when you're moving that many people to Node? And what the, uh, when I pitched this talk to, uh, to my colleagues, the, the answer was everything. So <laughs> thanks for the support, guys. Um, but a little bit about me and us with Bleach Report. If you haven't heard of us, we do sports news. Um, that's me, senior developer. That's my Twitter. I'm generally on there ranting about things. Uh, feel free to catch up. I'll be posting uh, links to the slides um, later. Uh, but what do we have? Well, we have 60 to 100 million users, which is why I ended up at the 80 million users in the talk. Um, that translates to up to 250,000 users per second on the site at any one time. Um, we average about 100,000, but 250 was for uh, LeBron moving to Cleveland, which was fun because we found out about it two hours before it happened and scrambled to spin up servers. <laughs> um, for the, all of this, there's only five JavaScript, HTML, CSS developers for the consumer site. Uh, there's plenty of back-end developers. We're primarily a Ruby shop right now, um, although we also do Elixir. Um, but for the consumer site, that's it for, the, for anything involving JavaScript, so anything involving Node especially. You ever had this conversation? I know this is pretty much, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> this is pretty much why I had to pitch the product. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, there we go. OK. Um, so yeah, this is what, pretty much what I had to pitch the product. And uh, the reaction was, well, this. Um, because seriously, would you? Like, yeah, let's just change this stack that's been working for nine years. So and again, I'm sure you've run into this. Hey, uh, let's run JavaScript from the server, guys. You know, you're, you're Ruby devs, and you think JavaScript's of the devil. And roughly <laughs> this reaction happens. So you need to justify that. You want to rewrite your app. And in, in our case, we really wanted to rewrite our app. But why? How do you pitch that to people? And uh, the biggest thing for us was this. If an organization that doesn't pay down its techn technical debt, every calorie in the organization can be spent just paying interest in the form of unplanned work. And that, it's a great quote by Gene Kim. He's written a ton of books, and I highly recommend them. But we were really running into this. We were actually at the point where we were so slowed down by technical debt from this old app that we'd iterated on, spaghetti code. We'd pulled some pieces out, but it was still this massive monolith. We, we just were worried about building anything more because we were going to break something. And basically, this is how our app stack sort of looks. It's very simplified, obviously. The user comes in, sees this giant Ruby monolith that serves data to it, and there's a CMS portion, and there's a few little microservices that, that communicate between them, but primarily everything done in what we call B report. The goal is to move to this. And this may not look like a super big change, but the idea is basically to kill B report. And in fact, internally, it's called Operation Kill B report. Um, CMS is a much smaller Rails app, but the idea is that we should just have a ton of microservices that do all the data processing, and that can be in anything. Some of it will be in Node for like GOIP lookups, some of it be in Elixir for our notification services because it's highly concurrent, even more so than Node. Um, and then B report will slowly, slowly shrink away and die the death it deserves. <laughs> My favorite quote from the early days of Unix. And it's true, there's some of the things that you have to do is prioritizing technical debt. That's hard to pitch to product. But when you're slowing down, like we were, it's easier to pitch because you're like, hey, how about we get rid of all this code so we can actually build features you want? So OK, it's a good idea to do this. But how do you get there? How do you convince people to do it? And then how do you do it? Another good quote for that one, you can use an eraser on a drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. And you've got to plan it right. Now, obviously, I'm here to talk about React. I don't think I need to tell you any you guys what React is. Does anyone in this room not know React at all? I figured not. Same with Redux, I'm assuming. Anyone not know Redux too well? I don't have to sell you guys on Redux. Excellent. Now I'm going to use this word. It's controversial. People seem to think it should be universal. And uh, I say they're very wrong. Because in mathematics, in sociology, in crystallography, in biology, it's all the right thing, because what I'm actually building when I'm building a node app 
from running on the server is not going to be universal. It's not going to be all the same code. It's going to be mostly the same code. Probably all of the same code. But there's going to be differences. So that's my little rant on isomorphism versus universal tangent. But these are all good ideas. These are all things that we pitched to product. And they were like, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, so what? And it's true. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You have to connect them looking backwards. We may know what our problems are right now, but we don't know what our problems will be in implementing all of this. And we didn't. So we started small. This is basically how I pitched just React at first. So this is our site, as it looks now. And we started with that little bit at the top, scores. That was just a React. We converted it, the old scores one from an old, I think it was jQuery system, to React. Really simple, N not too bad. We were actually hooking it into uh, backbone models at the time. But that went well. So and then product, you can go, great. We'll do the whole of this section. We'll just render that client side. And that went great. That was last summer. And so now we're going to do the whole thing. Beca and because we went slowly, we were able to build up a culture of acceptance with Node. And I don't know how many of you guys have run into this, but we had a lot of resistance about running JavaScript um, on the server, which is, I think, ridiculous in this day and age. But so you've rebuilt your app. Great. What lessons did we learn doing it? And that's probably what you're mostly interested in. You're probably going to do it wrong. We did. Repeatedly. Um, to give you an example, the, the scores that I just showed you at the top. Originally, we used this weird backbone React plugin thing that ended up modifying props, which is the exact wrong thing to do in React. Um, it was horrible, and we pulled it out because it was horrible. Um, but we learned a lot building the initial thing that way. And that gave us more information to build the rest of the stuff in a different way. That's why you start small, because you're going to do it wrong. Learn those lessons small scale. And my most important thing, always code as if the guy that ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> This was, this was like 1993 that this guy said that, and we've progressed so far. Um, but it's true. Man, I know where some of the people that coded the previous code live. Thankfully, I'm not a violent psychopath, but I do know where they live. No, it's, it's not their fault. Running, when you're a startup, you're running on deadlines, but really, you're just trying to survive. You're going to incur technical debt. It's just going to happen. It's great if you run a perfect scrum system where you build in refactoring passes and good for you. But it's probably not going to happen. Let's be real. We've all had, we all, there's that part of the app that we all look at and go, no, no, we don't, we don't touch that. We don't go there. That is a dark place. <laughs> but if you plan, if you have a good system in place, you can avoid at least some of this. We're, we're, it's, code's never going to be perfect. But imagine the violent psychopaths coming to your door. And to that end, we ended up developing a system based on atomic design. Now, I don't know how many of you may be familiar with this, but it, it's Brad Frost came up with this idea for design systems. And when you hear design systems, you may think CSS, you may think designers. No, design is universal. Design is code design. Design is application design. Design is data design. I'm not sure Brad Frost knows this, but he's created a really beautiful system for organizing your code, even though all of his talks are about CSS and SAS. It's beautiful. Um, it's a method of component and design organization. I kind of covered that. Uh, so in this case, you can see from, sort of from the diagram at the bottom, atoms build molecules, which build cells, which build organisms. And they build pages. Um, we actually added the cells thing. He, has, he just goes from molecules to or, um, organisms, but there's definitely a middle ground. Otherwise, you just end up with everything being a molecule and organism. It's kind of weird. And it works well with both JavaScript and CSS. And I really want to emphasize this, because if you Google that, and feel free. It's great. It's a really beautiful system. But you'll hear everyone talking about CSS and SAS. And it works great with that. We love it. But it's the big key to us was that this is not just a CSS thing. It's a design system. And he even hints at this on his page, but I don't think they've gone that far. We're not designing pages. We're designing systems of components. 
And they're talking about that purely from a UI UX perspective, but if any of you guys are familiar with React, hey, system of components, that sounds familiar. Um, so to give you an idea, this is, this is actually from our, uh, our app right now. Um, this is our SAS folder. You can see it's organized atoms, cells, molecules, organisms. There's other stuff, but I cut it out. And hey, look, our components. Atoms, cells, molecules, organisms. They're named the same, because they are the same. They're just related. It's actually, and the nice thing about this, I know this sounds really basic, but you can find stuff. <laughs> yes. Yay. Yes. You can actually find the code you want. There's just two files. That's it. And this, sim this is similar for Redux. There's reducers, actions, components, etc. They're all at that extra level, and they're all named nice and simply. Big learning here, compose, don't encapsulate. Now, that's one of those ones that sounds very buzzwordy. In fact, I think the buzzword is, that's like two thirds buzzwords. Um, <laughs> but, but what I mean by that is, from a very high level, you will be thinking about things and you'll encapsulate them in your head. Um, the easiest thing to think of is here is a list, a list of things, and you think, oh, well, okay, that list of things is one thing, and if I've got multiple lists of things, then that multiple list of things should be one thing. No, you've got one list, and you're changing the data in that list. Don't create multiple encapsulations, which what that is if you have multiple lists when you really only need one. You don't encapsulate all of the lists when you just need the one thing. And in this case, you'd be composing just having one component and changing the data. You don't even need to compose at that point. But you can do the same thing with uh, wrapping stuff. So like, for example, this is back with our site. And uh, with this, you can see over here, you can switch between different team streams. This is the list of lists I was just referencing. Originally, we had a big component here that was a team stream list, which contained a whole bunch of article lists. These are all article lists, by the way. Article list, article list, this is an article list. This is an article list. And we had a, we had a list of lists. Well, wait, why do we need to do that? Because we were thinking about that. All we ended up doing is just having one thing. This is, literally, there's like three components on this page that are at a high level. There's a few smaller atoms. But these are all article summaries, all this. This is, an, this is an article stream, article stream, article stream, article stream. And then there's a little bit for this. And a couple of links. But you can see so much difference. And the reason we can do that difference is because of the atomic structure before. We can say, hey, when it's in this location, this atom, or this organism, looks like this. And the code ends up being massively reused all over the site. So yeah, encapsulate is bad. And on that note, Challenge your mental models. And you can kind of guess where I'm going with this because I was just talking about challenging how you think about stuff. That's true both from a component standpoint and from a data standpoint. And with Redux, that's probably the biggest thing. Redux is great at storing your data. It's very, very fast. But what you tend to do is think, I should store the data the way the view needs it. Because, hey, I need to do this work. Yeah, until you need to change something. We need to update something. And then you realize you've got this massive tree structure that you have to loop through every little thing. It's horrible. Simplest way, key value. Have an ID. We know this because we use things like key value stores all the time. Because relational databases suck for speed. We know that. If we know that in databases, why are we doing it in the browser? Why are we doing it on our, in my case, a happy app or an express app? Why are you doing it in your node apps? Don't. Stop. Stop modeling your data the way you think about your data it needs to be. Think about how it needs to actually be portrayed for the, the best thing you need to do. So in that sense, data modeling. So flat data, for example, the articles. All those different articles, we just have a little articles key, and it's, key, it's keyed by the ID, and the object contains all the data. Originally, before we did this switch, it was this big tree of where it needed to be. Perfect. It's like, yeah, great. Now I need to update a value. Crap. <laughs> and you'd be amazed how something that simple might ruins your day. Flat is faster to serialize as well. And this is actually something I think very under, underappreciated with node apps. 
especially if you're doing the whole rehydrate thing, which you have to do with Redux or any Flux app really, or any, anything that's building on the client side as well. JSON.stringify is slow. It's not fast. It's as fast as it can be probably, but it's not, still not that fast. And you have a big tr complicated tree structure of your data, it's going to be really, really, really slow. Um, so we found simple key values, arrays even faster than key value, but it's way, way faster and it's easier to address because there's key, you know, key value store. And as I said, don't try to match the views data model. I'm going to say this again, don't try to match the views data model. It will only lead to pain. Now here's the thing, use selectors and memoize them when it makes sense. Now I don't know if you're familiar with selectors. I polled my development team, about half of them were familiar with selectors. Um, selectors are basically where you take a bunch of data and you say, okay, I'm selecting a bunch of data and I'm gonna wrap it into whatever format it needs to be and then you output out of that function the format it needs to be for your view. That's a selector, use those because that way you can store the data however you want fastest way, but then however you need it in the view, use a selector to get that. And memoizing is just saying, hey, only when this data change, changes, update it. It actually leads to massive in performance improvements if you memoize in certain cases. It's good practice, but it's a little bit of a micro-optimization when you're first doing it, but definitely look at doing it. There's uh, great libraries for it. Uh, for Redux, there's Reselect, I believe, is the main one, but uh, there's some great libraries for it. And APIs are not an excuse for bad app state. This might sound obvious, but you'd be amazed how non-obvious it is when you look at the application state that you've had for the last nine years. Um, it's very easy to just grab data from an API and dump it in your app and not worry about the, you know, you're like, oh, I have to pass it, that would suck, it would be slower. It's not an excuse, you're just, gonna, you're just punting the can down the road to whoever maintains your code later. And, uh, We've run into that. So that, that's definitely a, a lesson learned for data modeling. Um, for component modeling, again, avoid unnecessary encapsulation. And when you, this is a good one. When you find something feels weird, stop. Because there's a reason it feels weird, because you're probably doing it wrong. Remember the other slide? You're probably going to do it wrong. You've done it wrong. <laughs> uh, it's true. Uh, stop. You examine the code. Why does this feel weird? Um, is it just weird because you're unfamiliar with the idioms? Fine, that's fine. But probably feels weird because you're doing something a little bit against the abstraction. And, and fighting abstractions sometimes is useful in very specific cases. So it's not, it's not a blanket statement, but sometimes it's useful. But generally speaking, you can get rid of the problem by just refactoring. Maybe it's move this function to a reducer in Redux. Maybe it's, oh, this should actually be three different components. Don't know why, I've got them as just one. It seemed easier at the time. And it probably did, because it got yourself working. And that's, if you're doing Scrum, you're doing sprints, great. Punt it down the road to the next sprint. You've got a working feature, but mark it as tech debt, because then you know. Keep styles out of components. It makes your life harder. It really does. There's a big trend, oh yeah, you should put the CSS in the JavaScript. Did we not learn anything from the last 15 years of web development? <laughs> I feel old saying that, but <laughs> seriously, did we not? It, it, for example, for all of, if you imagine that, uh, that page I showed you, imagine if I put all of the styles for all of those different ways of things were gonna be displayed in the JavaScript. I don't wanna maintain that file. I don't wanna maintain that JavaScript, it'd be horrible. That's exactly what CSS is meant. That's exactly what SAS is for. Let it do what it's good at, let JavaScript do what it's good at, which is manipulating data and object models. Let it do it. Smaller is good, abstracted is better. If something's bigger, but abstracted out, it's fine, as long as it works. If you go too small, especially with the atomic stuff, you end up being like, oh yeah, I've got this link component. We've got that, it's called an anchor tag. <laughs> Why are you recreating it? Oh, well, you know, it's abstracted. No, no it's not, it's encapsulated. Mental models, again. And this is something we keep running into because habits die hard. Um, but it's definitely something to think about. Follow the abstraction, there's a reason it's there. It will make your life easier. Use promises, life is better that way. I'm just gonna say that. I know promises are a much maligned feature, mainly because people forget to put catches on things. Um, <laughs> I've done it. I'm not gonna lie, I've done it. Um, but seriously, they make, they make your life easier. 
Um, to use the example of Redux, um, Promise middleware, there's a great little uh, library called Redux Promise. It just means that you can use promises natively within your action reducer chain. They're completely transparent. It's great. Same thing with the thunk middleware. Uh, if you're not familiar with thunks, that's basically a function that calls other functions. Um, it's inverting the control flow of Redux. So you'll call a function that does some stuff that then dispatches actions rather than what you would normally do, which is just dispatch actions. Use async await if you can, if you rock in transpilers. Um, they really do make life a lot easier for async code. Use Redux actions. And I don't know if you guys have run into the looking at the Redux documentation and you look at the action code and you're like, Jesus Christ, that's ugly. I know I did when I first looked at Redux. I was like, what, what is this? It's FSA actions. They're these beautifully flexible, massively awesome, standardized way of passing around action data, payloads, error states, etc. Tons of boilerplate. And it really is off-putting. And Redux Actions is a little library that uh, makes creating an action really simple. If you put it all together, this is asynchronous code with uh, async await and Redux Actions. And it's just a simple create action, get user, it's asynchronous, pass it an ID, get from a remote API. That's going to use the fetch uh, library in the background because it's promise, it just returns a promise. And so it awaits it. And then, hey, look, it just looks like regular code. And then I return the result, which ends up going to the reducer. It's really simple. You write this with, without all of this. It's about this tall. Um, now, put that all over the app. And so there's a reason I say promises make your life easier. Promises and generators allow you to use async await. Redux actions allows you to just do this one line, generate stuff. And in fact, if all I was passing was the ID straight to it, I wouldn't even need to do the rest of this. I could just end it here rather than create a giant object. So that, that I strongly recommend all of that. I wanted to give you an example of actual code that we run right now. This is our section page code. Um, again, it uses all of this. So you've got a store dispatch. The first two store dispatches, oh, I should point out we create a store at the beginning because with Redux, you want to create a store per request. If you create one further up in your app, congratulations, you've got global store and everyone's getting the same thing. Don't do that. Well. <laughs> Depends on your app, I guess, <laughs> but probably don't want to do that. Um, so you create a store within the request. This is Happy, by the way. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Happy, but it's, it's the guys at the Walmart Labs created the instead of Express. Do recommend it. Um, but yeah, so this is Happy, and we create a quick store. We dispatch two quick actions, and then all of these actions we dispatch as a promise to all because, hey, they're all asynchronous and promise related. Look, it makes our life easier already. And then when those are done asynchronously, we reply with the store and the, the view of app in this case. Um, and it just works. Yay, that's our entire handler. We don't have to do very much. It's not the most pretty code, but I wanted to show you that actually in real code. Other thing, tools matter. Now, as I mentioned, transpiling. We transpile, uh, we use Babel. We also use Browserify, we use X, uh, so on. I can go on and on. But we specifically, we use Browserify instead of Webpack because Webpack involves a ton of configuration and gets you very low benefit over Browserify. If you want hot reloading, do it, it's great. Anything else, no point. Um, seriously, there's everything else Browserify can do. Um, we use Watchify to get fast rebuilds. Um, people always complain in Browserify, hey, Browserify is really slow. Yeah, when we first run it, about seven seconds for our entire part of the site that we're doing right now, section pages. When we save a file, 0.3 of a second. If you can get, get to your browser window before 0.3 of a second, well done. <laughs> uh, I want to see you do that. Uh, <laughs> yes, your keyboard warrior from hell, like, you ever see the, the hacker man gif from the, the, that dude? Maybe he can do it. Um, but if you're not, if you're not transpiling, I, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's really nice to do. It was much nicer to work in ES6 code. Um, Babel makes that really easy. Browserify makes that easy. Exorcist is uh, source maps. Uh, it's great. Uh, Envify, same thing, helps with Browserify to for environment variables. I'm sure you'd probably run into this. We use happy and happy React views for our React rendering. Um, we actually just got a pull request uh, 
approved for Happy React Views for uh, improving the layout engine, so you're welcome. Uh, no, it was, it was actually really helpful for us. We, we didn't want to fork it, and uh, they were really receptive, so the, the maintainer of that's awesome. Um, we use Uglify for compression, for testing, Mocker and Chai, Enzyme also, um, and Istanbul for running the tests. And I mentioned Fetch earlier, we use isomorphic Fetch. It's a nice, simple wrapper. It basically uses Fetch natively if it can, otherwise it does a polyfill. It's pretty simple. And obviously NPM. We use NPM scripts. No grunt, no gulp, no broccoli. There's another one. None of them. Um, there's just no need. Uh, with Browserify, we get all the piping. With NPM scripts, you can, hey, look, we can pipe. We don't need gulp because we can pipe with the pipe character. Um, but, and it means they're pretty portable as long as you're running on like a Unix-based system, which we're all running on MacBooks, so, or Unix on Docker or whatever, like, it'll work. Um, we haven't run into a need to use Gulp. We used to use Gulp, we, then we moved to Grunt, and then we're like, why are we doing this? We were spending more time maintaining our Gulp and Grunt things than we were actually writing useful features. That's a sign something's gone wrong, and we don't really do very much of that with NPM scripts, because it's a script. Hey, it's done, it works. We don't, we, otherwise, there's a compulsion to write more JavaScript. We're, we're programmers, that's what we do. You don't need to with NPM scripts. It just works. Uh, yes? What version of Node are you guys using? Uh, locally, 6.2. Uh, I think on the servers right now, 5.9. Uh, we were running 0.10 uh, <laughs> on, on a lot of our micro. I think, I think we still are in one of our microservices. Um, but we're planning to run I will upgrade to just 6.2 because it's been pretty solid. One, we, one, we were running into a bunch of debug output in the logs, but that was because a couple of libraries hadn't quite got things sorted out. And that seems to have gone away now locally, so it's probably going to go away. We'll have to test it on our Docker stuff. We're, we're Docker containers on Elastic Beanstalk. Um, so we can kind of fix it if we have to. But and I'm sure you're like, that's great, Greg. Give us data. So B report. 8 meg, I mean, I say HTML, it's ELB files. JavaScript. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I was maintaining that for the last three years. Um, 46 meg, now granted, we're not loading that on every page load. I want to be very clear of that. We're not trying to grind the page load, but that's spread across. This sort of talks about the technical debt. We have 46 meg of JavaScript across our site in various places, and we're not sure what all of it does. Um, so we're trying to get rid of that. I will say a lot of that is jQuery and jQuery libraries and random jQuery libraries. My, my favorite was when I first started Bleach Report was, oh, can you clear up jQuery? What do you mean by clear up jQuery? We've got more than one version running. What, like 1.9, 2.0? No. I look at it, 1.4, 1.6, 1.8, and 1.9. No two. Didn't exist. Um, we standardized on 1.9 at the time, because uh, we still had to support IE6. At the, yes. Um, we don't anymore, thank god. CSS, 10 meg, again, same sort of issue. This is all un this is uncompressed, not gzipped and stuff, but same issue, it's spread around everywhere, you're not quite sure what was going on. Lots more supporting Ruby code, crap ton of models, crap ton of controllers. If you've ever worked on a Ruby project, this is pretty normal, to be honest. <laughs> Um, it, you're kind of encouraged to do that, and that's not necessarily a problem, but it can make maintenance a problem, especially because we're running on an old Ruby and old Rails version. And there's a crap ton of Ruby code that basically does nothing. Uh, well, nothing for this purpose. It does a bunch of stuff. It's talking to the database. It's doing user management. Great. It's nothing that you need to worry about for displaying the actual site. It could be a microservice, and that's what should be a microservice. So, you know, it, it's not needed. It's a monolith. We don't need it. Node report. HTML, well, none technically, but uh, sent to the browser generated is around 58 kilobytes for the average section page. Not too bad, better than 8 meg. JavaScript, entirely across the entire app, 1.5 meg um, for the bundles, not, not for including necessarily all things that run on the server. Um, but that's 240k gzip, it's not too bad. Um, most of that's libraries, like 1.1 meg of that, is, like uncompressed, is React and a bunch of the other libraries. So, yeah, we're not doing too badly on that. CSS, again, quite a bit smaller, about 120k gzipped. And that's the, that's the atomic stuff coming. There's very little um, 
if ideally none uh, code that is not reusable. Oops, go back. Oh God. Too far. There we go, and yeah, there we go. Supported by microservices that provide the needed data. And that's, that was the big thing. The whole point of this project was we don't need a monolith, we need data that comes into a consumer so front end app. And I'm, I'm sure you all have worked on Node stuff that does that. It's probably the most common use case for Node, um, at least seems to be. Uh, but yeah, so it's supported by a bunch. And that, that was fun, saying, hey guys, we made you more work. Port this stuff to a microservice. But to be honest, they wanted to because they knew the code was terrible and they've been itching to rewrite it. And so it actually wasn't a hard sell for most of the backend guys. It was, the hardest sell was for product. And that brings me to it. That's all I could cram in. And I'm already running five minutes over time, but I've been told that we have a little bit of wiggle room. So questions. I'll go, I'll go in order. We're good. <laughs> uh, actually, I have two, two questions. So right now, uh, it's, it's just the section page right now. We will be moving to article pages. When we do add in article pages, we're, depending, it depends on the page size, because like I said, most of that is libraries. So if we're saving 20K gzip to, for the rest of the code, then we probably won't worry. We'll just do one bundle, because it'll be faster when people switch between sections. But um, Browserify has the factor bundle plugin. I think that was written by Isaac. Um, and uh, the, you just have the entry points. So you'll have articles, you'll have sections, and then it'll say, cool, what's common? And switch that out to a common thing. We do that actually on our old site for the old system. Uh, when we were just doing the React stuff, we, we decided to see what the difference was. Turned out that the uh, non-common stuff was actually quite small. We ran with it anyway, because hey, why not? But um, that's how we would do it. Whether we will need to do it, I don't know. Um, again, it will depend on the size of what they actually come out with and if it works out any faster, practically speaking. Do we have server-side Yes. Yeah, so what we do is we render everything on the server, but we have, um, actually what we do is when we deploy, we bundle. We actually bundle it on the Docker file. We run, the, uh, we run npm run build js prod, the npm script that we set up to, run, to build the file, and it just sits there in public, and it goes, oh, okay, I'll load this file. And it does that on local or uh, um, production or staging or whatever, depending on what, the, if it's production, it'll do the production. If it's staging, well, actually, if it's staging, it'll do production as well, because that's a good practice. Um, but local, it'll do development build with all the debug messages and everything. Sorry, could you try to uh, repeat the question for the Oh, yeah, sorry. The, the question was, it has a similar structure. Um, but how do you do, like, uh, when you're doing server-side rendering, how do you do bundling different um, like discrete parts of the application. How do you how do you factor that out and factor bundle? Basically, is the long story short. It's it's really trivial actually. It's really quick. Um, I found it actually speeds up builds if you have a lot of complicated logic. But uh, again, it was one of those things that with uh, with Webpack, everyone's like, yeah, it's it can factor out into different things. I'm like, yeah, it's like a browser file. I don't understand. Why is everyone so excited about Webpack? I feel I'm taking crazy pills. Um, but yeah, and you had a second question. Yeah. You told that you have also a lot of microservices mm -hmm. uh, besides the like, node backend. Yes. Uh, how they are communicating with each other? It's uh, just a REST API or hooks or other stuff? <coughs> yes. Um, so the question was, we have a bunch of microservices and he was curious about how they communicate with each other. Um, so we managed to DDoS ourselves because too many of them uh, communicate with HTTP. Uh, don't use HTTP for microservices, it's a bad idea. I mean, if you have to, fine. But um, you run into what's called thundering herd issues, basically. Um, so we have a bunch of core microservices that communicate with uh, RabbitMQ message passing. It's pretty solid. And then we can always say, hey, it's not responding. Kill the server, bring up a new one. Yay. Um, so that's. But yeah, the answer is yes, because we use both. And we should be using HTTP less than we are. But 
perfect is the enemy of good. <laughs> and then uh, so, uh, there was some, yeah, you had a question uh, first. It's more in regards to the microservices. Mm -hmm. You're consuming the microservices from uh, the Node.js application. Yes. Well, yes, sort of, yes. So my question is, how are you handling on the front end, how are you handling when a microservice throws an exception? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you handle the graceful degradation of the user? Like, if something fails, Depends what it is. Um, I mean, obviously, if it's if it's the core thing, then oh, is that relate? Is it related to the same thing? Oh, repeat. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a good point. So, um, for those that can hear, um, microservices. When microservices fail, how do you deal with that? Um, graceful degradation and so on. Um, it depends. Yeah, it depends on what it is. Um, for for one of our services, if if they, it does can't read it, it's like oh. We can't show anything, so we'll show a message of, we can't show anything, sorry, come back later. It's basically the site's down, except it's not down, down, but we, can, we don't have any data. So, and, but there's also caching layers and stuff that will come in on top of that. There's things that sort of DevOps can deal with that will mitigate that because we have like CDNs in front that, oh, this service is down, I'll just serve the last good version. Um, but at the same time, if something that has to be real time is down, it's more a question of what, what is that? And then what does graceful degradation look like? And that's a choice you have to make at the data level and at the application level. Like maybe it's that fit like for scores. Maybe it's just scores doesn't show up. It's just not there. That's okay. It's not really no one's gonna care. I mean, they might care they're about well, how the warrior's doing on against the calves. I I don't know. I wish I had a scores app. They might be. <laughs> I love you. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know they might care, but at the same time, there's not like this big, ugly, broken code. For bigger things, you're going to have to worry about error messaging, and that's where promises actually work really well because you can catch stuff at the API level, at your in API interface level, and return what your backup plan is. Um, a lot of yeah, we we use uh, we have a bunch. I mean, we have some. We use uh, AWS's. Toolkit a lot for that. Like so, we have uh, each app has like keep alive uh, type of things, and if things are in deg degraded mode, or what their services are, what position. Like if hey, I'm trying to ping this service and it appears to be down, and they're like, well, it looks okay over here. When I look at it, well, there's clearly a problem. Things like that. Um, so yeah, we have monitoring. A lot of it relies on AWS. We probably could be better at monitoring, um, but uh, it's it's mostly using pre-existing stuff, and sometimes throwing servers at it. Because sometimes that just works. Uh, we, we sometimes have to auto scale. When we found out LeBron was going to Cleveland, we, it's kind of bonus of working in a sports organization. We found that out two hours early, and uh, which was kind of cool. No one tweeted anything, obviously, but um, we got we scaled up from something like 30 servers to 60 servers, and we still had to scale up later when we we're like, oh god, look at that graph. Um, because sometimes just throwing servers at it helps. Um, but when it does go down, it, it just depends on what the app is and where the, the piece of the app it is. But um, yeah, most of that for the node report stuff is done in the, uh, the API files, which are just promises, returning promises. Uh, yes, you. Sorry, there was a big line of three right there. So, <laughs> um, so we, we promoted v4 and v6 quite a bit, so there's a huge amount of uptake in terms of users. But um, I was curious to hear. Not a lot of people are using V5 because it has like a limited support cycle. So I was curious if you've run into any problems or anything. It's so edgy. No. Um, so the question was, uh, so pe people seem to be using V4, V6. There's because V5 doesn't have much of a as, as much of a support cycle. Honestly, we, we, yeah, it's 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 yeah, yeah, it's it's fine because th at the end of the day, we plan to upgrade anyway. Um, if it works, upgrade it. Maybe not like. Bleeding edge, but Node's been pretty stable. I mean, and let's face it, most people were running 0.10 for like a year or two, and three. or three. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, so it, uh, in terms of no, Node's been very stable. We we test, obviously, we scale up, we roll out, and then we ramp up traffic. But um, yeah, we just found it's been stable. So 5.7 was actually a rock. Um, right, I don't know why. I've had more problems with 5.9 than 5.7. I don't know why. It wasn't like major issues, but randomly the server would just stop. And then I'd be like, oh, restart. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, so we're, uh, we're, we're planning to move to 6.2, I think. 
um, soon-ish. But uh, it, it was no specific thing other than it was available at the time, and we figured, hey, newer, new more features, hey. We're, we're pretty open that we, we were running Elixir back when it was like barely Elixir. It was more like Eli. Um, if you go to any of the Elixir conferences, they're usually um, uh, sponsored by B Report because we're, we were really, really early users. We had uh, Jose Valim, who's the, uh, the creator of the language, he gave us a big talk in at Bleach Report. So we were, we're not afraid of like a little bit of occasional crash bugs because, hey, that's what analytics are for. And, Microservices, yeah. Hey, it went down. Let's put it back up again. Oh, it went down again. Eh, there's probably a problem. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Back there. Uh, according to the page load times and the resource that you used, how much did you save after this change? You know, if I'd bothered to look at that, I'd know that right now. It, was, it wasn't it was insignificant, but it was probably less than you'd think from a user perspective because we have like a whole bunch of CDNs in front of it. So it's more about the work our servers do. Um, we're, oh, in the in terms of resource usage, uh, like I said, we're about it's about 400k total page weight, right? And not including ads, because ads. I know, um, <laughs> but uh, not including ads and not including images, because we're a very image-heavy site and we can't really control that. Um, we cut it by about half in terms of the actual content that was being delivered. In terms of the number of requests. I think we were at four, and we were at about 16. So <laughs> pretty good. I mean, that part of that, though, is just the application design more so than necessarily Node. But um, without Node, we wouldn't have been able to do the atomic stuff with, and the components. And so it's all sort of interrelated. Anyone else? Did, yeah, oh. Actually, just a question. Uh, is it a dad joke? It is, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But if you, if you come to these often enough, you'll find that <laughs> Excellent. Um, Just sometimes. We're waiting. <laughs> uh, come on, man, last month was great. <laughs> uh, so you guys are uh, React on your on your main page. Uh, is there any plans to maybe dabble in React Native for your mobile applications? Is that something you guys are thinking about at all, or are you going to stick with Native? Is it something I'm thinking about? Yes, because I'm a big React fan. So uh, for those that didn't hear it, uh, React Native. We're using React. How about React Native in our mobile app? We have a very popular iOS app, uh, TeamStream. If you've been watching the NBA playoffs, you've probably seen it advertised on, on TNT. Um, probably not. Not because we don't want to, but because the guys that run that app, there's like two of them. Um, <laughs> plus, I think, a third from a consulting company. So it's, it's actually quite a small team because it, it's uh, it's loading a lot of data from our app. So actually, when we switch article pages over, which is the next step after section pages, um, it'll be running React. It'll just be running it through a web view. <laughs> so it won't be React Native. Um, but there are a lot of the articles are all just from the website anyway. They're all responsive. So yeah, no immediate plans. I would love it. But I think, I think it would really help iOS development, especially with that atomic thing. I think that would be really useful. But uh, there's no plans, unfortunately. I, I, I would be the first person to be like, yes, but no. And, and I wish. And do I have time for a few more questions? Or I've got to, okay. So I've got to wrap up. I guess I will. I thank you all for hearing me blather on and being very opinionated. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>